Hey guys, come on in. Welcome to the uh, Clayrite Workshop. I'm your congenial host, Joe Rock Edwards. To my regular viewers, I love you guys, uh, I told you last week that we were going to do something totally different, something we hadn't done before. And I'm good to my word, I was overdue. We're going to do the wheel. You figured that out already, didn't you? Okay. This was a pot that I was working on when y'all came in. I made it a little bit earlier today, and I was trying to get it into the uh, leather hard stage so that later on in the show I could show you how to trim it and perhaps put on a handle and maybe a spout or a lid or, or gosh knows, depending on what our time is like. Now, being the ex-repentant uh, school teacher that I am, uh, I like to use that standard format that most people are familiar with. I like to tell you where we're going, right? And then we'll start beginning, and then we'll get there. Some people just don't want to get in the car unless they know where that car is headed. All right, well, I'm telling you where we're going to head. I'm going to show you throwing the wheel. I'm going to cut the wheel off. I'm going to hit my little accelerator pedal down here on my foot. And um, I'm going to show you what we're up to, okay? I'm going to uh, stand up now and show you around the studio here a little bit. Okay, uh, over here on the very back, you see a coil built pot. All right, it's a beautiful pot. Now, we did that once before with coil built. On the far right is a form built pot, and it has a painting on it. I stole these from my wife earlier today. I took literally took them off our uh, back deck and out of the studio, the various places around the uh, home to bring them in here, and they have her flowers in them. All right, the first one was coil built. The second one was form built. These are previous shows we've done. Now over here you see the face pot with handles with the nice red man's face on it. That is an example of slab built. We of course did that on an earlier program also. And of course you can combine the things you've learned. The pot over here on my left, this green one, it's one of my personal favorites. It's slab built, a square rectangular pot, green, and it's also coil built so you can combine slabs and coils together. That's a lovely pot. I'm rather fond of it. Okay, now on the table the white pots you see are all belong to my students that are currently studying there at the studio and um, they are in the bisque form the white ones here and you know when it's bisque because it'll have a nice little ring to it. Hear the ring? That means it's been fired. Alright, this one here these are two different students. This student is very mathematical, very what I would call left brain. So it's very symmetrical and their design is very symmetrical. This student's a little more creative, a little more uh, tactile, and they have literally put glazed pieces of tile onto their pot. This child here is multi-dimensional. They made the pot of the wheel, then they painted, then they went back and they glued little sequins to it, all right? And on the far right is another student that is a little more right brain. They're more creative. They're not conformed, and they love pouring and slinging the paints and so forth. And that's why you see the purple and the orange and the dripping of the paint. Now, I'm going to go over here to uh, our blackboard, and I'm going to tell you what we're going to be up to, all right? The show is called, for those that want to get copies and ask me about it, they all have titles, and we're going to call it Wheel Pottery One, because there's a lot of ways to make pottery. It originally was uh, handmade with coils and slabs <coughs> going back into the Ice Age 30,000 years ago. And the wheel didn't come along to almost about five, some say 5,000, some say 2,500 in Egypt. The god Khum, K-H-U-M, Egyptian god, gets credit for it. He didn't sign it or anything, but that's who they gave credit for. Now, what we're going to do today is, as usual with our teaching, we go step one, step two, step three, everything we do in sequence. The first thing I'm going to do is get a ball of clay. Now, the way most schools and teachers teach people to throw is what they call a two-pound ball. That's roughly the size of a softball. It's a good hand size to work with. Your hands can get a hold of it. So I'm going to make a two-pound ball. Then I'm going to take the ball and I'm going to center it onto the wheel head. I'm going to throw it down sharply and it's going to stick to the wheel head. All right. Then the second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to center that clay so it's perfectly symmetrical. And that's the whole genius behind the throwing wheel, the centrifugal force of the wheel. If you hold still and let the clay comes to you, just like you good looking people out there, you don't have to chase somebody. You just hold still and let them come to you, girlfriend. All right. Same thing. You don't chase the clay, you let it come to you. So you just have to hold still 
and your hand will shape and form the clay and it will be perfectly centered. Now once the clay is centered, we'll do what we call the first pull. That's when I put my thumbs in the center, create a doughnut effect, and then I literally, and it's called pull, these are correct artistic terms, I'm going to pull the clay upward. Now, uh, old timers, and I've had the good fortune to meet a lot of professional potters that have been in the business like three generations, and they call it throwing clay because I'm going to take a ball and I'm going to throw it onto the bat. That's the name of the wheel head. Ball, bat, throw. Ta-da! Okay. Now, you'll do a donut. You put your hands in the center. Keep your mind pure, which is hard for some people. It's easy for me. Focus. Keep your mind pure. Get it centered. Then I'm going to grab the clay with my fingers like this. You may not be able to see it. See how my hands are moving? I'm going to pinch the clay and I'm going to pull it upward. Now, some of the old timers, I heard them call it pulling the clay, but uh, when I studied art back in the uh, 60s during the uh, hippie sexual revolution and everything, I was drafted myself. I was wounded. I'll talk about that later. Anyway, during the 60s, they didn't call it pulling. They call it, get ready for this, legitimate term now. I'm not making this up. They call it screwing up. And you'll see why it's called screwing up, because as the clay spins, it makes a Archimedes screw-type lines, and you literally are screwing the clay upward. Now, we'll get the clay in a tall, hollow cylinder. Then you can put your shapes on. You can put a hitch in the giddy-up, as it were. You can do a trumpet tulip shape, or you can have the Benjamin Franklin stove bulb shape, or any combination thereof. You have to get your height first, then your shapes. You have to do that in sequence. It's like you have to put on your shirt and then your necktie. And you hear me quite often, I make reference to how right brainers think. They think outside the box, they think creatively. And sometimes that's great and sometimes it's not so great. And when I'm dealing with people that are extremely right brain, they always want to light the candles before they bake the cake. They do everything out of sequence. And sometimes that doesn't work. That's why, strange enough, throwing on a wheel has been part of um, therapy at hospitals and places that help people because it teaches you sequence and it teaches you focus and it teaches you balance. I and mean, look what it's done for me, that and the medication, and I'm almost normal. Okay, now we're going to go to work. I'm going to move the bat, and the bat is stuck to the wheel head by uh, two uh, nubs that stick up, and there are, this is dangerous, there are holes in the bottom of my bat, you'll see them, and these narrow holes have to fit over the screws. And a lot of my students say that is the most difficult thing to do. Now, I have a series of bats here, and they come in different styles, and I like this style right here, it's my favorite. There are four sets of holes on the bottom of the bat. And this particular wheel, and this, the wheel I'm using today is a Brent wheel, and it's called, I call it a traveling wheel because it's not as heavy as my, uh, some of my other wheels. And this is the one that I go out when I'm going around the uh, state as artist and resident. I go into classrooms and I teach ceramics or churches and retirement homes and wherever I go. Uh, this one's easy to transport. And the nubs that stick up uh, fit in these holes. And this particular wheel, it fits into the holes that are closest to the outside perimeter of the bat. Now, I kid you not, uh, one of the most difficult things I'm going to do is I've got my fingers stuck into these holes, okay? And I have to turn the bat upside down and stick it into the nubs on the wheel, and I can't see. It's like working in the dark with your eyes closed. Somebody said uh, when a, something is difficult, they say, I feel like a blind man in a dark room looking for a black cat that isn't there. All right, it's not quite that hard. Here I go. I'm going to sit down on the wheel. I'm going to turn it. I'm going to line them up. Put my fingers here, and I'm feeling the nubs on the backs of my fingers. Got that one? Got that one? I'm going to check and make sure that it's lined up. Wow, looking good. I did the first thing right. Um, I have a, a more young students than I do older ones, and they're quite excited to wheel because it is so much fun. And they're, if you can imagine my analogy, like a birthday party, they can't wait to blow the candles out, and so they quite often they're trying to cut to the chase, I think it's called. And that's why I mentioned the wheel is therapy, because you can't go faster than your hands can go. And this is something that helps the anxious people to realize you can't get ahead of yourself. All right, I got my bat on. Next 
my notes, I need a ball. Now, I need a ball of clay. So I have a nice 25-pound uh, block of clay here, and that's the clay, way uh, most clays are sold. I open the bag up, and I leave the clay in the bag because the clay that I don't use, I will close the bag back up and put a twist tie, a clothespin or something, and uh, the clay will stay fresh and moist and workable almost indefinitely. But if I leave it open, it begins to dry out. Now, I picked up a brand new set of tools, and it was funny because I have lots of old tools, and uh, this is a standard set of clay working tools for the wheel, and I was just reading the advertisement on it, and it said something about the must-have uh, tools for creating with clay, and that pretty well is the case. You have to have every one of these tools. So I opened it up here. They even have names, but most artists uh, tend to give names to their, uh, their tools. Okay, the first thing I'm going to need to get my hands on is what I call, oh man, is the Garrett, and I hate these things because this is the brand new one, and I have to get it unstrung. Now, a Garrett, or sometimes called a wire tool, is nothing but two sticks with uh, held together by this wire. I'm doing, and it's under tension, as you can see, it's like a butterfly. Hey, I think I did this better than usual. Sometimes I am like a Southern Baptist preacher. I'm guilty of every sin that I preach against, and I quite often have so much fun I get excited too. All right, here's my garret. I don't know how good y'all can see that wire. All right. Now, it's the easiest way to cut the clay. See how easy we cut this block of clay. And remember I said a good way to start out is with what we call a two-pound ball. Now, this clay uh, is straight from the uh, factory. I've been using this particular brand of clay for 25 years. If you can look here, it is beautiful. There is nothing more clean and pure than uh, clay coming from the factory other than my conscience. Uh, oh, you can reprocess clay, but it'll have little air bubbles in it like bad bread that has all the air bubbles in it. Now, uh, in biblical times, they call it treading the clay, and they put it in the big vat, and they worked it with the feet the same way they kneaded bread, and they did the wine press. They did a lot of stuff with their feet. All right, there's even biblical uh, terms about the potter's shed. I think it's in Jeremiah or Isaiah, about the potter's shed, and about treading clay. They use pottery a lot in biblical references because it was something that everybody could relate to, you know, a cracked vessel and uh, forming the clay when you... Uh, pun, uh, when it's a bad vessel, you break it and start over again. So there's a lot of biblical references to potter and uh, clay. Okay, here is my ball, two-pound ball. Now, you probably noticed the top of the uh, wheel head, and I'll, I'll get one over here in case you didn't. I'll communicate with you better. There's always a series of... Um, Circles. It looks kind of like a bull's eye, and that's important. We're going to need because it's called centering the clay, and I have to get this clay as close to the center as possible. Now, we can't be polite. This is a limp wrist thing, okay? We can't be polite because if this clay has to stick to that wheel head, because in the middle of making a pot, if it isn't stuck, it will go flying across the room and hit somebody. Now, it is funny but then I have to start over again. So we don't want that to happen. We don't want to launch any pots. We've got to make sure it's stuck. And it makes a very unique sound. You, you will know this sound, all right? Here I come. <laughs> I love that sound. Okay. I'm going to tap it. It is stuck. Now, uh, I go out to festivals and so forth, and I let people line up, and I let them throw on the wheel. Matter of fact, that's what all the white pots you see up on the shelf over here, they were all done by children, most of them preschool age, the very first time I can teach a five-year-old child to throw uh, a pot on the wheel. And I get so much fun out of this because I had this little munchkin person, follow the yellow brick road, that little munchkin are this big, and the first time in their life, they feel the clay in their hands. And even I, after doing this for, for decades, I haven't lost the thrill. Like, you never lose the thrill of, of catching a fish when you feel that fish pull on the line. It's such a unique experience. Or the way a good bow feels when you release the string and, and it vibrates in your hand. This is uh, for those kinesthetic learners such as myself that we learn through touch. This is a wonderful experience. I, I hope all of you get to have a chance to experience this one day. When the clay begins to spin in my hand without being corny and trying to wax poetic, 
it feels alive. There's a rhythm to it, and it's moving almost like when you grab a little fat puppy and you feel him breathing or something. So it does feel alive. And there's a biblical word, and I was trying to put it in my memory. I think it is mishka, and it means forming with uh, your hands. It's the word they use in old Genesis, a Hebrew word meaning when God made man out of clay. And you do, you get this sense of creating something, and it's a wonderful sense. Okay. Traditionally, you start the pot on the highest speed, centrifugal force, and then once I get it centered, I will slow the speed down. So I'm going to go to my highest speed. And one of the things I do is when I have a rookie here, I will let them touch the clay, and if they try to touch it now, their hands will just jerk and jump around, jump and jive in, like trying to grab onto a hummingbird, right, or a three-year-old. You know, you can't do it. So. I put a thin film of water. Now, I don't know how good your sets are, if you can see my hands, but you see my fingers moving around? That's because this is not centered. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to center myself over the clay. I'm going to bring both hands together, uh, favoring my right hand, and I'm going to think pure thoughts. This is why you liberal Democrats aren't usually potters, because that's the hard part. I'm making a bit of a bad joke, but you do, you have to focus. And I do find a lot of students that it's the, they have trouble focusing because they're trying to multitask. That's not bad. Now, do you notice how smooth my hands are now? Notice they're not jumping. All right? The clay is centered. Now, strangely enough, that's the most difficult thing I'm going to do. At this point, I can teach three-year-olds to do this. Now, I don't even have to touch the sides now. You always favor your right hand, and you're not playing tug of war. I push to the left, I push to the left, right, left, right. Once it's centered, there's not so much pushing. This is as soft as ice cream. Now, if you watch me, I'm just going to drop my thumbs in very lightly. I'm not even touching the side. And right now, in the inside of the pot, it's getting dry, and it's getting a little bit warm, and it's beginning to get kind of jerky. So I put again a thin film of water. Now, this hand I'm putting on the wheel head, and this hand is inside the clay, and you get a sense of how thick the bottom of your pot is. If I go all the way through, I don't have a bottom in my pot, and if I don't go uh, down deep enough, my bottom is too thick, and uh, I'll have to go on a diet. Okay. Now, perfectly centered. Now, Traditionally, textbooks and professors will teach you to put your hand on the inside and make a little dent where your finger goes in, and it's like catching the windowsill on your fingers and pulling up the windowsill. But you're going to catch the clay between your two hands the way that I catch the stick between my two hands and I pull the stick up. I've caught the clay, and this is what I call screwing up. You should see the screw marks. You'll also notice the clay getting taller. This is sometimes called the first pull. See it get taller? Again, just a thin film there. All right. I'm going to go back to the bottom, what we call the second pull. Most production potters usually don't pull. They're so good, they don't have to pull it but about twice. There's a pot. That took a minute. Now, I'm going to slow it down. I'm wearing my little Mickey Mouse clay shoes here today. They look like, these shoes look just like my wife bought me a pair. They look like Mickey Mouse feet, but they're, uh, they're rubber, and when I spill the water and so forth, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't get my feet wet. Now, everything's good. Now we're going to start, as I've shown you on the board, we did the ball. We did the first pull, now I'm going to do the shaping. Now I'm going to take just my fingertips, just the very, very tips of my fingers. I'm going to go down about midway of the pot here where I'm pointing to, and I'm going to push outward, and I'm going to get a slight little belly on the pot. A little thin film of water on my hands and on the inside wall. And here I go, I'll do it so y'all can see it. You see the bulge? and I bring it slightly upward. Now, there are certain shapes that are famous with certain uh, nationalities. 
uh, anagama. Uh, there's names for the wine vessels with the two arms. There were names for the chalice, you know, the, 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 the Holy Grail, the chalice, the cup of Christ. Uh, there were certain shapes that have certain functions, and there are certain shapes that are uh, connected with certain um, religions and or uh, nationalities. All right. Now, over here, when it showed you my essential tools, this is called a potter's rib. All right. This is a form tool. Now, I've got a lot of potter ribs over here. I have a nice selection of my own potter's rib. This one, I can make it a bowl. This is the one that like, comes in the kit, and I have several others. Now, the potter's rib is beveled on the edges, like a knife is, and there's a hole here, so when your hands are covered and slip, you can grip a hold of it. Now, I'm going to go in here, and I'm going to push the bottom in a little bit. There we go, bottom's in. And I probably could pull the top out some more. Uh, while I can, I'll show you uh, another tool over here. I said I would. This is a handmade tool. A friend of mine is a woodworker. He made me a larger one. So if I wanted to turn this into a bowl, I could go inside and pull it out. Now, I'll show you how easy this is to do at this time. If I just hook my fingers on the side here and I pull toward myself, do you see it getting wider? See how we altered that shape? All right. Now, I can't work it with so much like bending a cheap spoon back and forth before it would break into the water, would have saturated the clay, and it would be weak. So if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I'm going to leave this alone. So at this point, I cut my wheel off. I cut my wheel off, and I pick my bat up, and this is how I move my pot. So as a production potter, I will be ready to make another pot. Now, this is um, what I'm calling um, wheel throwing one. On wheel throwing two, I'm going to teach you guys how to uh, put a handle or a lip or a spout or a lid or some of the other tricks. That was just the basics right there of throwing on the wheel. Now, we only have just a few minutes left, so I'm going to do a quickie. I'll do a refresher with you. All right, this is a different bat. We take the bat, we line it up with the two screws. Remember that? Sometimes this is the hardest thing to do. If you don't start out right, you won't end up right. We take the ball of clay. Now, this clay has already been wedged or de-aired or pugged. A lot of people will ask about that. We get it in a nice round shape. Uh, don't overwork it. Once it's round, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. It's the shape I want. Now we throw the ball at the bat. Throw the ball at the bat. We're on there. We take our wheel to full speed. Put a thin, thin film of water. We hold still and think pure thoughts. That's the hard part. The joke about that is when I said think pure thoughts, I'm saying you just focus. Now I have the wheel centered. See how my hands are holding steady? Put my thumbs in. Sometimes it's called opening it up. Push down toward the bottom. And I begin to pull up. That was my first pull. Remember first pull? And now I would do my shape. In which case, we'll just, we'll do something different this time, okay guys? We'll make a bowl. Remember how I said there were different potter's ribs? This one's different. If I put it here, the centrifugal force, it wants to go out and down. So I'm just making a bowl shape. Now, you of course could make, uh, if it was stoneware, we could make some nice uh, cereal bowl, coffee bowl, something of that nature. Now, a lot of people have trouble because they think clay is so messy. But you notice I'm wearing a clean white shirt. I've just made two quick pots. I rub my hands, and I'm ready for supper. So it doesn't necessarily have to be me. Now, I'm going to just make sure the school teacher, we only have a couple of minutes together to make sure that I... Uh, cover the information that I wanted to cover. Here were my notes for this week. My glasses out here. 
We've done pottery. We know that it started, of course, in the Ice Age. It's as old as 30,000 to 12,000 years old. The important thing about pottery was it allowed you to make vermin-proof grain storage jars. So the ancient people could uh, store their grain for the winter or sell it to other uh, neighbors and cultures because they could transport it and the weevils and rats and other things couldn't get inside. Uh, the Egyptian came up with throwing wheel about 2,300 years ago in the area called Summer. They attribute it to the god Kum. The first glazes were developed around 4000 BC by Egypt or Mesopotamia, and sometimes they were referred to as Egyptian paste. The Chinese developed pottery about the same time, and they used what we in America call groundhog kilns, where you put the fire in one cave and the pots in a second. If you've ever seen those, we have these here in the North Carolina hills. And I got a little dragon here because the Chinese called it the spitting dragon when they had this thing on the hillside and the flame and the smoke. The uh, Ch Japanese called it an anagama. Uh, was the name of that uh, hillside. Uh, the Japanese word raku translates to enjoyment for those of you that love raku pottery. That's when you remove a red hot pot from the kiln and roll it in sawdust and uh, you get all these neat cracks in it. In Greek mythology, Helen of Troy molded the first wine cup over her breast. I think that was so cool. And they said the goddess Athena, the patron of the Greek potters, created the earthenware pot it was the Germans that gave us salt glazed, all right? And in 1900, there was an increasing trend towards artist pottery, and that was the beginning of the arts and crafts movement, which I am a proud member, all right? You guys tune in next week. I'm going to do the wheel one more time, and I'm going to show you how to put handles on it and spouts and lids, all right? I'm going to still play with this because I need some more work. I'm glad you guys tuned in. I want you to come again next time. I hope you get a chance to do pottery. It's a one-in-a-lifetime thrill. you got to do it. It's one of those things, geez, I wish I'd have done it. Joe Rock has shown you how to do it. If I can do it, anybody can do it. Okay, I'm going to play with this because this is too much fun not to. Every time I do this, I think of those little children when they first touch the clay, and I look over at their faces, and every time the clay is spinning, they go, and it's such a wonderful thing to see those faces. It's like, it's alive, it's alive. So if a six-year-old can do this, and I do this in nursing homes, you guys can do it too, all right? Keep this cards and letters coming. I appreciate the comments y'all been making. Give me ideas for things that you want to see and new projects for next time. So I very much appreciate you guys uh, going to my website and giving me the little notes. And I definitely will read them and I'll give serious thought to any legitimate suggestion that you make. Because some of the suggestions you made are pretty weird. All right. Until next time, you got to have art. All right. Here I go. Let's see what damage I can do to this.